Today we will be discussing ST elevation MI high yield concepts. Acute coronary syndrome arises from sudden or gradual rupture or erosion of a plaque, leading to obstruction of coronary blood flow. The chest pain worsens with exertion, not really with rest, and doesn't change with body positioning. This condition typically presents as a sudden chest pain, or symptoms similar to angina, frequently occurring without any obvious trigger. There are three types of acute coronary syndrome, ST elevation MI, non-ST elevation MI, and unstable angina. Today, NSTEMI and unstable angina are now collectively referred to as NSTE-ACS. ST elevation MI involves an EKG finding of ST elevation of at least one millimeter in at least two contiguous limb or chest leads. It involves coronary plaque rupture, causing platelet adhesion, activation, and aggregation in acute thrombotic occlusion. The result is transmural myocardial ischemia, which is the ST elevation seen on EKG. This requires immediate reperfusion therapy. However, there are several conditions that can mimic an ST elevation MI. One of those conditions is acute pericarditis. Patients present with acute chest pain that may be pleuritic or positional, and the EKG findings shows a diffuse or localized concave ST elevation with PR segment depression. Another condition that can mimic STEMI is acute aortic syndrome. If the dissection involves either the right or left coronary artery, it can lead to transmural myocardial ischemia. The buzzwords to remember in this condition includes pain described as tearing pain with radiation to the back, different blood pressures in the upper extremities, and mediastinal widening on chest x-ray. Severe hypercalcemia can mimic ACS, but this also includes short QT interval and flattened T waves. Left ventricular hypertrophy also has EKG changes similar to ST elevation, but the changes are more concave in appearance. The well-known mnemonic MONA has historically been utilized to recall the medical management of acute coronary syndrome, representing morphine, oxygen, nitrates, and aspirin. However, current guidelines do not universally recommend oxygen and morphine for all patients with ST elevation MI. Oxygen is not routinely administered if a patient's oxygen saturation exceeds 94% and they exhibit no signs of respiratory distress. Similarly, morphine is not routinely given particularly in patients who present with low blood pressure. The medications to think about as initial management in ST elevation MI includes aspirin, P2Y12 inhibitor, beta blocker, nitrates, and anticoagulation before a PCI. In primary percutaneous coronary intervention, drug-eluting stents are preferred to bare metal stents to prevent restenosis, myocardial infarction, or acute stent thrombosis. Keep in mind that primary percutaneous coronary intervention improves survival if performed in less than 12 hours after the onset of symptoms with ST elevation MI. In patients with ST elevation MI with cardiogenic shock, primary percutaneous coronary intervention, PPCI, improves survival regardless of the time delay from onset of symptoms, even if the symptoms occurred more than 12 hours. PCI is performed in less than 90 minutes of medical contact. Coronary angiography is done first to identify the severity of the coronary obstruction before a PCI is done. During a PCI, a balloon catheter is advanced past the affected artery and inflated to expand the blocked artery, and a stent is left in place to keep the artery open. If the patient is in a facility that is not equipped to perform a PCI, but can be transferred to a PCI hospital within 120 minutes from first medical contact, PCI is still preferred. If PCI is not available within 90 minutes, thrombolytic therapy is an appropriate option to break down the clot in the coronary artery, but make sure to check if there are any contraindications. If thrombolytic therapy fails, patient is transferred to another hospital who is PCI equipped for rescue PCI. If there's reperfusion after thrombolytic therapy, 
patient is still transferred to a PCI-capable facility for coronary angiography and possible PCI management. If ST elevation MI is considered and it's been more than 12 hours after symptom onset, there could already be a significant myocardial necrosis. In this situation, PCI is only indicated if the patient has ongoing ischemia. So those are patients with ongoing chest pain, hemodynamic instability, dynamic EKG changes, and ventricular arrhythmias. Otherwise, instead of a PCI, medical therapy is recommended. Why is this? If there's a large area of myocardial necrosis and reperfusion is performed, the damaged cells can produce free oxygen radical that can further damage the myocardium and cause more inflammation. Thrombolytic therapy is recommended for ST elevation MI when symptom onset is within 12 hours and PCI is not available within 120 minutes of first medical contact. Although newer thrombolytic therapies such as alteplase, retoplase, and tenecteplase are more expensive than streptokinase, they are associated with improved infarct artery patency and less allergic reactions. Thrombolytic therapy, however, is associated with risk, and this includes intracerebral hemorrhage. And therefore, understanding their relative and the absolute contraindications to thrombolytic therapy is important before you take your exam. Besides thrombolytic therapy, patients should also receive loading dose aspirin, anticoagulation such as unfractionated heparin, noxaparin, or fundoparinox, and a loading dose of clopidogrel. A follow-up EKG is performed to confirm reperfusion with at least 50% improvement in maximal SD elevation. Rescue PCI is a scenario where a patient with STEMI who received thrombolytic therapy is transferred to a PCI-capable center. After thrombolytic therapy, coronary angiography is performed, even after a successful thrombolysis. There are certain post-MI complications that you need to know before you take your exams. Arrhythmias are frequent complication of ST elevation MI. This encompasses conditions such as atrial fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia, and they develop within one to three days post-MI. Also, transient heart block, and this includes Mobitz type 1 and complete heart block is commonly associated with inferior MI. The primary approach to management in this case involves temporary pacing, not permanent pacemaker. Ischemic complications such as reinfarction, perinfarct ischemia, and infarct extension is most common in the initial few days, a few days to one week. Mechanical complications such as mitral valve rupture, ventricular free wall rupture, and tamponade usually occurs in the first week to first month. Three potentially life-threatening mechanical complications of acute MI includes rupture of the left ventricular free wall, rupture of the interventricular septum, and development of severe mitral regurgitation. ST elevation MI complication that occurs one week to even months after an MI includes inflammatory complications such as pericarditis and post-MI Dressler syndrome. Now let's discuss some rapid-fire concepts. There are three types of acute coronary syndrome, ST elevation MI, and STEMI, and unstable angina. And STEMI and unstable angina are now referred to as NSTE-ACS. ST elevation MI is a transmural myocardial ischemia, and conditions that can mimic ST elevation MI includes acute pericarditis, acute aortic syndrome, severe hypercalcemia, and left ventricular hypertrophy. Dual antiplatelet therapy, DAPT, includes aspirin plus a P2Y12 inhibitor. P2Y12 inhibitors include clopidogrel, prasugrel, and ticagrelor, as part of the management of ST elevation MI. Keep in mind that ticagrelor can cause dyspnea and or bradyarrhythmia, and prasugrel has a black box warning for bleeding risk and should not be used in patients with active bleeding, prior stroke, or in patients over the age of 75. Initial management in ST elevation MI includes aspirin, P2Y12 inhibitor, beta blocker, nitrates, and anticoagulation. Morphine and oxygen are not part of the initial management. Drug-eluting stents are preferred 
to bare metal stents. And in SD Elevation MI, if a patient is sent to a PCI capable hospital, PCI is performed within 90 minutes of medical contact. If a patient is sent to a non PCI capable hospital, but can be transferred to a PCI hospital within 120 minutes from first medical contact, PCI is still preferred. If PCI is not available, thrombolytic therapy is started. In SD Elevation MI, PCI is important because it is known to improve survival if performed in less than 12 hours after onset of symptoms. However, PCI is not recommended if the onset of symptoms have been more than 12 hours, unless the patient has ongoing chest pain or hemodynamically unstable. PCI is preferred in patients with SD elevation MI with cardiogenic shock. And fibrinolysis is part of the SD elevation MI management. However, fibrinolysis is not indicated for unstable angina and non-SD elevation MI. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed our high-yield key points on SD elevation MI.